Welcome back to another week of Overwatch 2 Hot Takes. First one of the week is Cold Take. Wait, this is not a hot take at all. Ryan is the worst tank ever in Overwatch. Half of the roster can essentially negate his ability to play the game. Um, Believe it or not, I actually still think it's a hot take. I would never say Ryan is the worst tank ever in Overwatch. That would probably belong to another tank. He didn't say Overwatch 2. I'm being pedantic now. Um, in Overwatch 2, that would probably go to Roadhog or Wrecking Ball for the majority of Overwatch 2 until a couple of the reworks had recently Ball's been pretty good and there was that patch in Season 2 where Ball was pretty solid as well when they buffed him and they tuned it back just a little bit. Uh, there were phases where Ryan was certainly played quite a bit. You know, don't get it twisted. I think what a lot of people's takes on Ryan is that he's just... When, when the cards aren't aligned, it can feel incredibly hard to play into. And that could be said for, for ball players. You just don't hear it as much because there's less ball players. And there's a lot of Ryan players who love the glory days of Overwatch 1 where he was great. But in Overwatch 2, he's certainly seen better days. That is true. That being said, I know the devs say like Ryan's win rate is pretty even, even in unmirrored matchups. But that doesn't negate player feeling and player sentiment where if you're playing Ryan against many many frustrating things it can feel like the world is against you and i actually think ball is a bigger culprit of this again it's just because he's not as popular where there are more heroes in the roster that can negate ball's ability to do what he does a simple boop from lucio stops fireball you know does a simple boop slow down ryan probably not you know hack screws both ball and ryan over flying heroes maybe doesn't uh, you know farah and echo can annoy the shit out of ryan a little bit more than then that ball because he just roll away but you know it comes and goes push and pull um i think ryan is pretty bad i think he's like low c tier even with the buffs this patch simply it's not because um he's he can't play the game it's because i just think the other tanks are better and the better tanks can can punish him a little bit more uh if if the team isn't built around him one thing i do think he needs is probably some sort of damage mitigation when he decides to charge if you think about all the gap closers on the tanks, a lot of them, if they do have a gap closer, it comes with a defensive tool. For example, a gap closer, like a speed boost on Draco Queen when she shouts, you get a lot of overhealth, 200 overhealth. When you spin as Orisa, you, get, you don't take any damage from the front because it's eating all the projectiles. When you're charging as Mauga with the overrun, you're un un unstoppable, is that the name of it? and you're, uh, you take damage reduction. So a damage reduction when Ryan charges for his gap closer, because he needs to get close to do well. And if he's just stuck holding his shield the whole time and slow, that could pose a problem. Or, you know, you add a damage reduction on the charge or allow him to not have too much of a movement speed penalty, if not no movement speed penalty when he holds his shield. Would that be a little too OP? I don't know, but he does need like a little bit to make him less frustrating to play. Uh, against some matchups for sure hot take make ball a damage hero so they don't have to prioritize survivability as one of his main attributes since he's a tank this would give the devs flexibility in where they adjust his uh abilities and values ball survivability comes from his mobility but high mobility doesn't always mean he's the best tank especially at low ranks with less coordination moving him to damage role would give devs more freedom in designing or balancing him you know I thought it was a hot take, but I actually think it's it's kind of cooking. It wouldn't. I think you could move May as a tank because I play a lot of Heroes of the Storm. And honestly, making Ball like a ping pongy kind of DPS hero to roll and do damage actually doesn't even seem that bad of an idea, believe it or not. At least in my eyes, kind of cooking with this one. Supports still not being able to see which allies have the DPS passive applied to them uh, feels like if DPS players could not see enemy health bars. Like, I don't know if I need to commit more to my teammate or not, depending on whether the passive is applied to them. Just like a DPS wouldn't be able to judge how much more they need to commit for a kill if they couldn't see the health bar. This is another hidden thing that makes a DPS so strong still and makes it so hard for supports to have anywhere near the level of impact of DPSs despite naturally disadvantaged being a support role. Uh, not a hot take. I agree with this. Right now, on the current mid-season 9 patch, there is the indicator on the first person bar on what the healing status effects are right now. If you have an up arrow, it means you're healing amplified, like by an Ana nade. If it's a down arrow, it means you're being affected by the DPS passive. And if it's uh, the anti, it's the anti. You can actually have both up and down arrow. You could be like friendly naded by an Ana, but still be shot by a DPS and have both arrows. So right now, if I'm a support player, I can't see what my teammates, if my teammates are affected by the DPS passive. You can only see it in first person for yourself. 
but that's not very helpful i'll be honest i played like 50 games since the patch hit on tuesday like 20 games on um uh on tuesday and wednesday and some today i never look at the left of my hp bar and go like oh there's a I'm being affected by a DPS passive. It's not relevant. The only time that DPS passive is relevant is for the support hero while they're healing. If I'm an Ana and I see an arrow on my teammate's bar going down, I can be like, oh shit, it's it's good knowledge to know he's affected by a DPS passive right now. I have to pump some extra heals. That's useful for supports, but not useful for first person. So I agree. They definitely need to add it as like a, on top of the HP bar for allies. Nothing too distracting, but for support players to see or um, party frames. When you play PvE or any of those missions, you know how all your teammates' HPs are on the bottom left? There could be an indicator there, maybe on the right side, so at least you can just glance at it from your peripheral vision to see if they're affected by it. Something to help the supports, not for your first person. That change was kind of useless in my opinion. I mean, it's there for those who want to use the information, but it's pretty meaningless for, for most people. Hot take, having a mercy pocket is more of a burden than a blessing. Sure, your damage numbers are higher, but I already have the DPS passive. It just feels like more eyes are on me when her blue beam is connected, and I have to keep her safe. I made Farah, so I can't really be aggressive or I'll put her in danger, etc. Um, Anna or Zen Pocket, I guess they're asking for that. Um, that is a hot take. Thank you for giving me an actual hot take that I can honestly respond with. No, it's not a burden over a blessing. Dude, having a mercy pocket is a blessing. You say you have to, you have uh, more eyes on you. That's true. But the blue, you say blue beam, but she can also flip the healing at any point as well. Like that's, that's just um, more reason for you to pop off because you can have damage boost or healing at literally a, a flick of a finger, switching between a, a beam or two. Um, you just, I feel like you just don't like the pressure of having people having to, to take you down. You want to play like a really solo flanky style of Farah, which is acceptable. You can literally tell your Farah or your Mercy, hey, don't follow me. I'm going to go for some weird cheesy play. And I will also say, you put the part where you say you have to keep her safe. That onus is not on you as a Farah player. Your job is the one to pop off. It's the Mercy's job to keep you safe and using her movement to fly away if she's in danger. So I think you're concerned about the wrong things here. Don't worry about the eyes on you. You worry about popping off. Um, and if you want to fly aggressive, so be it. That's the mercy. It's on the onus is on the mercy to, to, to not go too deep with you if you're trying to do something cheesy. Or you just tell her, I'm literally flanking the back line. You are either with me or not. We're a ride or die package. Next hot take. People who get triggered by diff need to honestly work on their mental fortitude before playing video uh, competitive games. Um I wouldn't say uh I feel like triggered is a little extreme in terms of like how people respond to it but like um people can be you know if you're someone who types that and you're trying to get in their head i get it you know it's a competitive game and if you're like very upset about it then probably like um it, i would say your mental fortitude it's not worth getting like visibly like unreasonably upset people who write the diff thing should like if into you should, should light a fire under you that's my take on it where like if the person's running support diff i'd be like all right queue up again buddy like i won't say i'll be like queue up again and i'll i'll roll you next game like they're just looking for a response so my i mean my personal mental fortitude oh whenever anybody types that to me i don't say anything if they have better scoreboard stuff than me and that's all they rely on it just proves to me that they don't really understand fundamental overwatch because your stats especially damage done and all stuff totally depends on the comp you're playing and the and the lineup that you're running like if i'm playing uh like anna right in a uh in a winston comp and the other team is playing a baptiste uh pumping heals into an orissa who does take a shit ton of damage and the baptiste ends the game with more healing than me and they type support diff i'm like apparently you don't understand like the numbers don't are meaningless in, in, in a compare in a one-to-one -one comparison like that because it's, it's so contextually based and if they don't understand that i don't even bother giving them a response because they, they don't get it so it's all good but uh i mean this take back to the whole triggered part it depends on what you define as triggered yes reasonably upset if someone's typing diff you need to like and you have to understand your limits if that visibly gets you upset either you work on your mental fortitude or you just hide the chat because you know it's not gonna you know sometimes some things may be out of your control and you're working on it and just hide the chat for yourself but yeah you should never be like too upset about someone typing that it's just nonsense all chat banter we're trying to get in your head Ooh, what is this hot take hot take zimming should be allowed on console 
let the game auto detect zimmers and lock them to PC lobbies. A PC is more expensive than a mouse and keyboard and if Minecraft can do it, there's no reason why Overwatch can do the same. Can't do the same. I didn't know Minecraft can detect Zim. So Zimming, for those who don't know, is basically plugging a mouse and keyboard onto console, but um, gaining the benefits of aim assist because aim assist is there for controllers to make it so like the tracking is a little bit more forgiving. So when you have a mouse and keyboard with aim assist, it can truly feel like aimbot. And it's a big complaint in the console community for those who Zim. Understandably, I've never seen it. I've seen some footage of it. Somebody sent it to me because I play on PC only. I've never really seen aim assist plus mouse and keyboard, but it does look kind of cracked. Um, when you say let the game auto detect Zimmers and lock them to PC lobbies, that seems like a nice idea on paper. It, you say it's, I don't really know what the, the networking infrastructure is to do something like that, but it would, I guess it, it wouldn't be a bad idea if it was reasonable, plausible, and like with a hundred percent certainty that if this person has this thing plugged in, are we certain they are Zimming? It's probably more of a logistical thing, more so than something that like I, I disagree with or I agree with, excuse me. So. Like, I think it, it sounds good in theory, but executing is another one. Hot take, another another hot take here. DPSs don't need a roll passive. I think they've had three passives by now, and they have all been heavily criticized. How about we try the game without any DPS roll passive at all? Um, They've had a few iterations of the DPS passive. That is true. First one was the, what, the, the speed boost. Then it went to the reload only, and then now it's this um, anti-heal. Uh, you said, how about try the game without DPS roll passive? I mean, then wouldn't it feel like they're left out? I would just say, try the game without any roll passives again. Kind of like how it was in Overwatch 1 and start from there. That's that's my hot take. Um, but right now, I feel like if everybody else has a little bit of a, 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 a roll passive, there's no reason that DPS shouldn't have it. Um, or else we're back to what the previous seasons where DPS roll feels kind of bad. Right now, it does make the DPS roll a lot more important with this heal reduction. It's minor. But it's certainly effective um, when you like try to look under the hood. And I think it's actually in a pretty good spot. I've really enjoyed Season 9 with this. I really don't have any complaints so far. Next spicy take. Doom players complain and overreact way more than Mercy players. And when Mercy players do complain about something, it's valid at least 90% of the time. <laughs> okay. I am going to go on a limb here and say... Doom players, Genji players, Ryan players, and Mercy players are the more heavily complained hero main people. And I apologize if you are under any of those categories. I'm not saying your complaints aren't valid. They're just very loud and echoed because I'm sure a lot of them are valid. And then you say when the Mercy players do complain, it's valid 90% of the time. I mean, that number is arbitrary and up for interpretation. Doom players, when they complain, some of them is valid as well, right? A lot of bugs. Mercy players complain. A lot of it is valid too. Rhyme players complain. Valid. Genji players, not valid. Sorry, Genji players. I think your hero is pretty freaking good right now. And if you're complaining about Genji, I don't know what you're smoking. But Mercy, Doom, Ryan, I actually kind of get it. Genji, what are you bitching about? This hero is great right now. What on earth? Anyways. Next hot take. The only reason why I hate, this can go for a lot of people, uh, the real, so only reason why I hate push and flashpoint is because they don't have near than enough maps to balance the game modes at all. It gets way too boring and repetitive to play the same old two and four maps. Ah, uh, I sort of agree. If you play the game mode, you are locked to two or three. That's right. Suravasa and New Junk City only for flashpoint, and the push only has what? Esperanza Coliseo, New Queen Street. So. I do think Overwatch needs to maybe have four maps in each game mode and then maybe slow it down from there. I think that's more than enough. Believe it or not, the game has like 40 something, 41 maps. That's more than Overwatch Heroes. It's actually quite a lot to learn. And just adding a few more is probably the right way to do it. I, I agree. Um, it can be boring, repetitive to constantly play the same map on one specific game mode. So yeah, some more there. I actually don't think they need to add any more hybrid maps or... Um, or or payload maps or, or control maps to be honest with you you can slow down the cadence of maps and work on more heroes that's my take i think there's plenty of maps and enough variants that i don't see the map enough i've actually been tracking my 400 plus games i've played in rank this season i have all my map data and each map doesn't get played more than like 10 to 12 times in a rank setting uh 
Like right now, 400 games is more than what your average person will play. I played 400 games of ranked and I see most maps on average 10 times right now. Cause 41 maps, 400 games, 400, 410 games to see each one on average of 10 times. Hot take, Junkrat can't be a fun or good hero without his one shot or a rework. In metal ranks, it's easy to get value by spam. However, in higher elo, it is incredibly hard to get value with junk. And now in season nine with the buffs, he is still insanely bad and needs his one shot to work. Um, okay, you say Junkrat can't be fun. Uh, that's subjective, so I disagree with that. Um, good hero without the one shot or a rework. <sighs> he has a very small niche. Now, one thing I will say, yes, he lost his one shot, but like his spam, the projectile size of the, the, the nade is actually bigger as well with season nine, which is something to consider. But yes, he does, does lose his burst potential with the one shot. And that certainly was a very effective playstyle for in higher elos, right? Spam can only get you so far. You get a little lucky. Um, good players will notice it and, and probably not walk into the same mine three times. But in the middle of team fights, like if Junkrat picks his spots right now and uh, still gets sneaky, you can't 100 to zero somebody, but a lot of heroes are taking a bit of chip damage. His playstyle is certainly adjusted where you have to kind of wait till people are whittled down a little bit or in an act team fight before you show yourself. And because he's an element of surprise and flanks like that and has to wait, that is not very conducive to confirming kills. Because if you go for a kill and they don't die and you're in an awkward spot, they can rush you down because you have no escape in a lot of times. So um, I, you, when you say rework, I sort of agree. He does probably need like another tweak to his kit, uh, maybe an extra mine or, or, or something that like isn't a complete rework, but keeps his identity, but helps him out a little bit without adding a one shot. I actually am a firm believer Widowmaker being the only one shot in the game is much better for the state of the game. Um, I don't think a lot of heroes should be able to two tap anymore. Like Symmetra not being able to two tap anymore is nice. Uh, and uh, they compensated her with buffs this patch. And I do think Junkrat needs some compensatory buffs, but not a one shot. I'm not actually sure what direction they should take, but don't bring that back. Um, hot take, Brig is one of the highest skill cap and low skill floor supports. Massively punishable for bad choices and missing flail, but when done well, no mistakes appears godly. When not done well, every other support feels more useful from a Masters 2 support brig. You can't say hot take and say it's also true, because that's just your take and you know it's hot for a reason. You know not a lot of people are going to agree with you, which means it inherently may not be true for most people. Anyways, highest skill cap hero, I disagree. I think the highest skill cap support in the game is Lucio. Lowest skill floor belongs to Moira. Yes. Massively punishable for bad choices. I mean, chucking a couple of packs, not really, and you get a free AoE heal if you, you smack someone. I think the most punishing one for a bad choice right now, mm, like missing a flail is whatever. You're still in the same spot and you have your shield. Let's say you miss... What's a, what's a, what's a good example of a support? If you miss something, it's bad. Missing a guardian angel is mercy. I mean, you have a two second window to get out, but that can be more punishing than just simply missing a flail. Who else? Missing a sleep dart can be very punishing, especially when it's one flanker on you. If you don't get that sleep, you're dead. So I don't know. I feel like missing a flail isn't the end of the world. So yeah, I, I think this is a hot take. I don't really agree with most of your break takes here. Uh, the one I will agree with is if you do it well, you can appear godly. That's true. But I do feel like that's true for a lot of heroes. If you play well and make no mistakes, you can appear godly for on any hero. Hot take. Kiriko is terrible for the game and should be completely reworked, but she won't be because she's the Overwatch 2 version of Mercy. Okay, you tell me what should be completely reworked. Did you die? To, did you get your stuff canceled by Suzu and now you, you gotta give me this hot take? Listen, I get it. It can be frustrating. Is it really terrible for the game? I don't know. I'm a Kiriko main, so I'm probably inherently biased. So you may not listen to me anyways, but I actually feel like Kiriko has been good for most of overwatch 2 there were times where she despite having all her tools like she's out of favor in favor of other support heroes that were meta like anna brig or there was a bap zen meta bap lucio was running rampant for a while it was the bap alari i mean there's been times where kiriko was certainly not you know the, uh, a meta hero by any stretch and she performs terribly in lower ranks too how is she terrible for the game in that capacity? I think your only frustration is maybe Suzu. The other one was the Kunai's two tapping people across the map. That's been solved now where, you know, it takes three consecutive Kunai's to kill across the map. But with everybody having 250 HP, 
I mean, that part's gone. So it's only Suzu that's probably the most frustrating thing. I would say her healing papers aren't even like that outrageous. I think Mora is easier to heal with. Other heroes heal a lot too, like Baptiste, AoE, all that fun stuff. Rush is a, Katsune Rush is a great ultimate, but you can kite it, you can get out of the way. I don't know. I feel like Kiriko is a, a pretty cool designed hero. Uh, the only, the only, the gripe is probably Suzu's invulnerability, but our support's not allowed to have any other invulnerability besides like Baptiste Immortality Fields and Yada's invulnerable, heals a lot of people. I guess well, it's because it's on a cooldown. Sure. Anyways, Suzu's been talked about a lot. Um, they got rid of, they lowered the invulnerability time. They got rid of the boop. I will say they could probably nerf the healing it gives. Because right now it heals 110 if they have CC. And that's pretty big. But I digress. Um, this is very extreme. We're saying it's absolutely terrible if the game should be completely reworked. A slight rework on a single ability, sure. But a complete rework with wall climb design kunais? No. Come on now. Okay, not exactly a hot take, but because it's the correct take. But still a hot take because how many people get this wrong? Zarya is not a counter to Arissa. Zarya's only strong against Arissa if she's at high charge, at which point she's strong against anyone. As an Arissa, I'm much more scared of a good Winston or ball player that can outpace me and kill my team before I can do anything to the big Russian lady going bzzz in front of me. I actually agree with this. I think a, I, I don't think Zarya technically counters D.Va or Arissa that hard. Yes, they have an advantage because Arissa has to can spin and Zarya can beam past it and just beam the front burly DPS or is because Arissa plays a little bit closer and has to take a lot of force. So it's a lot of like front to back, like square up between Zarya and Arissa. And if as you're an Arissa player, yes, if you allow Zarya to beam you the whole time, then you'll probably lose it, especially if she's at high charge. But yeah, if she's at low charge, nothing happens. Same with Diva. Diva can pick and choose her positioning in battles. Yes, uh, Zarya can beam down the D.Va, but at um, but um, you can leave at any time. So I think in the higher ranks, the better you are at the heroes and more proficient you are, the counters are not really as 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 written, which is true. Yeah, Zarya's not a hard counter to Orisa. Um, some parts better than the others, but yeah, oh, I agree. And you say you're an Orisa player, being scared of a good Winston or ball player. That is true as well. Uh, a lot of teams you just outpace and you jump past them and then your team engages on the back line. Sometimes as Arissa, you just left in the middle of nowhere because your team uh, just got jumped. So yeah, I mean the tank matchups are, 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 are very skill and matchup dependent and rank dependent. Okay, last hot take. If you expect endorsement uh, should have, if you expected endorsement should have any bigger role, there should be negative endorsement as well. Are you saying like you want to endorse somebody to like that or sorry a negative endorsement so not an endorsement because that's just like uh just like a like a i didn't like this person versus like encouraging them the problem with that is like it could be just giga abused like a lot of people would just like the person wouldn't have said a thing they just play the game and then they just say i hated this person because we lost so then people would just like point fingers and then somebody just can have a very bad rep because of the hero choice they play. What if some people just don't play the game that serious and they're just casually playing and you just get negative endorsement spammed? So like, I get it, but like I don't at the same time. Some people play for different reasons, so I don't think uh, they should have a negative endorsement. Okay, I think that's it for the hot takes of the week. Leave yours in the comments, don't leave an essay. Keep it nice and sweet. Give me more spicy opinions. Some of these aren't even that spicy. See you next time.